Welcome to my talk on visualizing relativistic quant mechanics. For most people, the best they do is to visualize you know, some of the names that uh, people who contributed in relativity and uh, quantum mechanics. This way you can put a, a face to the names, <clears throat> but I want to do a little bit more than that. Um, uh, topics of quantum mechanics and relativity are generally regarded as rather complex, uh, mostly mathematical, and here are just some examples of the maths that are used. I'm not sure that too many people actually understand what they mean physically, but that's another story. Uh, most people regard this as this rather complex. Now, the complexity, there are a couple of people with who, in my opinion, have contributed to the complexity. One of them was Dirac with his comment that it is more important to have beauty in one's equation than to have them fit experiment, because discrepancies due to minor features can be cleared up with further developments of the theory. Yeah, well, that's how it works in theory. A couple of points, uh, you know, whether anybody can know, knows what this under means physically, I, I don't know. Um, but a couple of points about his work. <clears throat> First of all, Lorentz, by the time he got around to deriving his theory, which uh, these are the corrections he had, or the uh, Lorentz had already come up with a square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So the main contributions he made was adding uh variations with mass and then later on re actually realizing that hey with those variations it actually means e equals mc squared now while math is essential it's absolutely essential to understand physics i forget who it was in about the 13th century some englishman pointed out that yes uh maths is absolutely essential to understand science and i agree with that and then here we have just a good example of uh, Einstein, a couple of variations of Einstein's gravity field equations and their accepted Schwarzschild solution. Uh, no, uh, whether anybody can use these equations or know what this means is a, is a whole new story, but uh, it, it worked. So why not? Yeah, everybody knew it worked, but nobody knew what the physics was. Well, in two and a half years ago, the Institute of Physics published a paper that I've written on physical explanations of Einstein's gravity. A major feature of that was that I showed that Einstein's mass distorting space time was producing photon redshift. Now, what I'd like to uh, show is that. The accepted solution, everybody knows, is DSC 1 minus alpha, et cetera. Well, it's wrong. The reasons for that are pointed out in the paper, but just to briefly go over them, he derived terms for G11 as minus 1 plus alpha over R, which he turned around and approximated it to minus 1 over 1 minus alpha over R, and that 1 minus alpha over R term is what is used up in, in the solution. Now, when alpha over R is something like 10 to the minus 8, I mean, that's considered a very good approximation in anybody's language. Now, again, Einstein's uh, field equations, I think most people have great difficulty understanding them. This is accepted solution. Well, the difficulty was so great, they came up with this solution to his field equations and when it really should have been this but to find out how it works in uh, practice uh, newton's inverse square law gm uh, over r squared is well known the on the uh, you've got a, a grab it from alpha which the exit solution is gm over one plus alpha over r times r squared or gm over 1 plus 2z times r squared, where z is the redshift. Now, they, they just show that really, despite all of the complexities, when you get through it, you work your way through it, you find out that Einstein's uh, solutions are just a, a minor variation. So rather than being uh, Newton's theorem being a, a first approximation to Einstein's theory, uh, what you really have is that Einstein's theory is a minor modification to, uh, to Newton. Okay. So 
approximations because there are three approximations that they had to use to get this answer and it's not accurate and it, you know, these aren't just aren't accurate across the whole range of whatever it is the other thing i'd like to point out is that uh, i have this thing what i'm calling the redshift solution that's derived from a quantum mechanical derivation of gravity in other words if you if you take the properties of nucleons and you handle them in a particular way you finish up with this equation and it just means that the our our, uh, our distances unless you have a tape measure your distance are measured by photons well when the wavelength of the photon changes its distance changes now the answer is not just the same as the planet orbiting a little bit further the body orbiting a little bit further away from the uh, now, what I'm going to show you here is the, uh, the four gravitational fields. Uh, you have Newt Newton's inverse square law, both uh, Einstein's gravity and this redshift gra gravity. And this is for an object that is so massive that its source shield radius, uh, shown here, is well outside its physical radius. Uh, and what you find, the acceleration due to gravity is at a maximum of uh, 0.5 alpha. And when bodies are being attracted in, they'll reach their maximum speed at 0.5 alpha. And that'll give them the equivalent of about a temperature of about 10 to the 10th degree C when they collide. So what you would expect to see would be this donut shape centered around the 0.5 alpha. And what you actually finish up seeing is these so that's not a black hole it's just a very very massive object now, now i mentioned the above to just show that people using complex mathematics can and do make major mistakes it's not that there was any mistake as such made by einstein other than that was to use such complex math that nobody could really follow them uh, but however, uh, the, on the on the positive side for him, the complex mathematics that nobody could follow meant that people thought he was an absolutely mathematical genius, and he, I mean, he was a great mathematical physicist. Uh, but mathematics doesn't make things happen. Things they happen for physical reasons. My suggestion and what I've been doing is work out the possible physical reason, use mathematics to calculate the magnitude of the effect. And if the calculated effect matches observation, it has some validity. If it doesn't, modify the physical effect and try again. Just because a mathematical answer has been arrived doesn't necessarily mean that it is valid unless it has some physical effect supporting it. And then finally, have, uh, Einstein's, if I can't visualize it, I can't calculate it. And so what follows is how to visualize quantum mechanics and special relativity. The universe exists in three space dimensions and time. Those dimensions and known physical principles and constants are all that are needed to visualize relativistic quantum mechanics. Now, before I start out there, I want to just point out uh, things that people know are obvious, but sometimes don't think about it. I mean, everything uh, is shown here. You've got the classical you know, Newtonian mechanics. Everything here can be explained by Newtonian mechanics. You don't need quantum mechanics for anything like that. And uh, things happen for logical reasons that are predictable. But uh, just take water as an example. You know, Bulk water has got density, viscosity, it can be boiled, frozen, made to flow, things float on it, others dissolve in it, and so forth. Most of all these properties are well known. But when you get down to ultimately, ultimately you get to the stage of water molecules. Now, there are one, uh, two hydrogen atoms attached to one oxygen atom. You can't boil it can't freeze it I mean, nothing floats on it nothing dissolves in it it's a completely different from bulk water 
Uh, and even beyond that, you then have uh, the makeup of the atoms themselves. You've got a nucleus with uh, protons and neutrons and, uh, and electrons going around it. You know, oxygen atom has eight of everything, hydrogen is one of everything. And none of these you know, protons, neutrons, electrons had anything that remotely resembles what could be called bulk water. So what happens in quantum mechanics, you, have, you get to a stage where smallest units are in discrete steps and you have one of them, two of them, three of them, or four of them. It's a completely different situation where everything is continuous so that these steps disappear and you don't have to worry about, well, that's classical mechanics, uh, you know, Newtonian and Maxwell. And that's essentially the difference between the quantum and classical worlds. Now, in, in the early stages, when they discovered electrons and discovered photons and so on, they didn't know really what they were. They knew that wave properties are the uh, attempts that were made to describe the properties of electrons and was basically uh, wave equations. And here are a couple of examples and then put beside Einstein's gravitational field equations. I think most people would just scratch their head and say, well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> But waves have a couple of helpful features. One of them is that they extend over great distances. And the second thing, that there are all sorts of manipulations that you can use, like Fourier transforms and that sort of thing. It's not that difficult to get a match in theory and observation. You can manipulate them that much. And Maxwell's field equations predicted electromagnetic radiations, electric field per one direction, magnetic field perpendicular, and they would move in the third dimension at the speed of light. And we now know that light has the smallest particle of course photons. These are just the people mostly responsible for that. You had Faraday, who did most of the work, the experimental work on which Maxwell's theory was based. We had Planck who finally worked out that you needed quantized particles with Planck's constant and Einstein who was the first person to measure them. And I'm sure most of you, you're all aware that the other contribution that Einstein made to uh, quantum physics was to observe that the molecular structure of water as the individual water molecules were moving the pollen grains around under the microscope. So he made some contributions to quantum mechanics as well. The uh, problem that people faced was that they didn't know anything about it, what the structure of an electron was. They didn't know much about what a photon was, or they just ignored Maxwell's suggestions. And they became fashionable for many quantum mechanics specialists to describe them as point particles with properties attached. Uh, and these are just some of them. They could then manipulate them quite easily and get a match, yes, but did it really have any bearing with uh, reality? So what I'm just going to go back to now is say, well, if I, go back, you know, if I can't visualize it, can't calculate it, but there's a sort of a logical simplicity in the, of the order and harmony. And I'd like to suggest that it's this, what I'm going to use, this is the same principles of visualization and simplicity used in this study, it extends to logically simplicity of the maths as well as that. And, it present, and I suggest this presentation reduces the maths to the simplest possible. And I can go again here with uh, Einstein's field equations. These are actually what they are, uh, what they mean. And I suggest that quite a few good high school matriculants could make these calculations, but only an exceedingly good specialist can make these, and even then they've got it wrong. So visualization helps enormously. Now, it's been known for some time that when a photons, which shown here as point particles, collide with each other or with a, um, a nucleus, as shown here, point particle representation, you get a, a particle and an antiparticle produced. And yeah, you can treat them as waves, you get the same effect, particle and antiparticle. And the other one that you have is uh, you get an antiparticle and particle together. They annihilate each other by generating waves. 
So it suggested that, therefore, the most logical explanation is that particles are confined photons. So in order to understand particles and their quantum properties, it's first necessary to understand photons. And I'm going to go here, go back, and this is your Maxwell's image of an electromagnetic field. It's just shown here as positive field going up up and then down in one complete cycle, same magnetic field doing the same. Conservation principles mean that a positive field in this direction automatically equates to a negative field in this direction. And the same thing, a north pole in this direction means a south pole in the other direction. Now, one of the features to note about this, though, is that a north pole in this direction is the same as a south pole in this direction. In other words, they, they reinforce each other, whereas a positive field in this direction is different from a negative field in this direction. And when where they cross over, uh, there is really no field at all. Um, these, these are just oblique schematic illustrations, uh, the ENB field, etc. Photons come in many in different um, arrangements. One of them is that instead of being plane polarized, they're what's called circularly polarized, where the field twists through 360 degrees every wavelength. Now, I've tried to illustrate that here, where the, the arrow represents strength of field, and it turned, it just turns around. It's not very difficult. I tried to do it here with all four fields, but yeah, it's rather difficult. Again, the, the, the important feature is that they, the fields twist. But when you do that, what you find out is that when it twisted through, three, through 360 degrees per wavelength, then each quadrant of north and south pole and positive and negative charge, they all remain in the one quadrant. Now, and that's in, illustrated here with this end-on view of circularly polarized photons. You can see the magnetic field goes through the middle and spreads out the same as same here. And what you have here is the electric field with a gap in between where they neutralize each other. <clears throat> so I respectfully suggest that uh, this the representation shown him earlier is, well, it's well matched by observation, let us say. Now, another feature to note is that photons have mass. I know a lot of people try to pretend they don't, but uh, it's been measured. It's been measured many times, and particularly by Martin van der Mark, and but a lot of others have done the same thing. Now, the way to visualize that it has mass is that when you have these photons moving along in this direction, it takes time for the fields to spread out as indicated. Now, that time, they can't spread out and collapse instantaneously. They spread out, collapse, and then it moves along. That takes some time, and it is that finite time that prevents photons from traveling at instant uh, speeds. And it's what I suggest, it imparts inertia and hence mass to photons. But, you know, others may have uh, different opinions as to how photons have mass, but they have mass and has been measured, and I'm one of those who believes that measurement takes place over elegant theories. So what you have is a situation where circularly polarized photons in rotating, their mass is rotating around, and we all know from Newtonian mechanics that a rotating mass gives angular momentum. It's been known that uh, the photons have, well, it's referred to as spin, but it's actually ang angular momentum. Its value is h-bar, and uh, the h-bar, what is called spin, because if you refer to something as a point particle, a point particle can't rotate, so they called it spin, but it is uh, the rotation of the electromagnetic field is actually imparting angular momentum to the photons. I suggested that's one part where quantum mechanics started to diverge a little bit from reality. So just like to summarize, my photons are oscillating electromagnetic fields, each perpendicular to the other. They always travel at the local speed of light in the third dimension. They have mass, frequency, wavelength. The higher the frequency, the greater the mass, the shorter the wavelength. 
They can be plane polarized, and circularly polarized, I and mean, circularly polarized photons have a twist angular momentum of h bar as they travel through space. And as I mentioned before, it has been measured. Now I'd like to go back and uh, just show, repeat what I'd uh, shown earlier, that yes, photons colliding can give rise to particle-antiparticle pairs, and that particle-antiparticle pairs can generate photons. I mean, this has been known for a long time. And so the most logical explanation for that, I would suggest, is that each particle is a confined photon. And the simplest confinement is that of each photon making two revolutions per wavelength. The reason for two revolutions per wavelength, colors only indicate the cycle. And as John pointed out uh, some time ago, you get a long structure. Now, in this case, I'm using a belt, twist it through 360 degrees, join the ends together, release them, and it comes out as a, uh, a double row. It just automatically falls into this double rotation shape. The other thing to bear in mind is that the color of the two-tone belt, you always get one color on the inside and another color on the outside. Now, you've got to ask yourself, okay, why would a photon rotate? Well, we'll just consider the situation. This is uh, representing a circularly polarized photon, and most photons are circularly polarized. In fact, all photons emitted by atoms, or any, any section of an atom are circularly polarized. Photons come along, they meet an obstacle which they can't get past. Well, basically, they wash up a bit. When they squash up, you'll find the, uh, the magnetic fields start to overlap, as do the electric fields also. But the magnetic fields are much stronger, and they're overlapp overlapping. The overlapping occurs in the magnetic field that spins the electric field around them. And what you have, as shown here, you have a, uh, you finish up with North Pole picking out in the North, in the, in the up direction, a South Pole in the down direction, a negative field on the outside and a positive field on the inside. Uh, from, from a conservation point of view, you don't have any angular momentum. This is straight linear momentum. The angular momentum this way must be replaced by another one with angular momentum the other way. So then you want still you still have the north pole and the vertical south the south poles are horizontal. And in this particular case, you'll get a positive on the outside and a negative field on the inside. Now a, a linear photon, the magnetic fields are just open. But when they form a, a rotating photon structure, you then have the magnetic fields become looped and a looped structure is much more stable than an open field and that's why when they can photons will go from the linear form to the uh, rotating form. Now the first thing to notice about that, and this is just a quick illustration of a photon, this is the axis of a photon making two revolutions per wavelength. It gives a, a radius r equal to lambda over 4 pi. It always travels the speed of light c. A rotating hoop has a moment of inertia i equals mr squared, mass times radius squared. The angular velocity omega equals c over r, which gives them an angular momentum of mr squared times c over r. Now, all individual particles have been measured to have a spin of half h bar. Now, if you just set that spin as angular momentum as originally defined, you just have i omega equals half h bar. Now, so substituting these terms and multiplying both sides by omega gives you mr squared times c squared over h over 4 pi, which half h bar, and then um, cross out the 4 pi, so you get hc over lambda equals h nu equals e, and if we go back here and cross off the r squared, you get e equals mc squared. Now, so that indicates that the relationship between energy and mass is that energy is a photon traveling in a straight line at C, and mass is the same photon making two revolutions per wavelength, still traveling at C. I uh, strongly suggest that the best indication of what quantum physicists call spin is the same as what classical physicists call angular momentum.
Uh, now, so just as a, a little bit of a summary, here's how you would represent, in this case, let's just consider it as an electron, you have a particle, the black ellipse is just, just its rotation, you have the positive field on the inside, a negative field on the outside, you have the magnetic fields in the third dimensions, and uh, it shows here that uh, this is a side-on view, and the, the, well, the field spreads out in the third dimension as it gets away from the particle. So, no, but that, that's fine. That's That gives you the fields and mass and spin and that, but what about charge? Well, a photon rotating at C and the diameter of an um, electron is about a hundred, less than 200 fm, 190, the radius is 190. Travelling at C is one all hell of a centripetal force. Now, photons are not what you'd call strongly bound structures. Portions of the, with this enormous centripetal force, Portions of the photon, which will also be photons, will be basically be thrown off. And they're illustrated, schematically illustrated by these blue lines. And it's, if they continue on and react with another particle, they become real photons. And if they don't, they're reabsorbed to maintain the mass of a uh, rotating photon. And that just basically uh, suggests that these, well, we, could be called secondary photons, have all the properties of virtual photons. Well, QED theory indicates that photon exchange is the mechanism by which electric charge operates. And this, I suggest, is the mechanism by which photons are emitted from particles. And the number or quantity thrown off depends upon the angular momentum of a rotating photon. All photons have the same spin, all charged particles have the same electric value, all neutral particles are half positive and half negative. So I respectfully suggest that this rot rotating photon structure is the origin of charge and it, it, the, the value of the charge is the same as the polarity of the external field. Now, that may seem to some to be a bit, uh, maybe a bit fanciful, perhaps. However, I'm going to show you here, it has been measured on uh, protons to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 17 meters. Now, in this rotating photon model, the central core should have a diameter of 0.105 fm. And that is shown here is that very small diameter there and when they've, me they've measured the charge distribution of protons and it shows that very close to the 0.1 fm you get this maximum and that's why i suggest that yes that is the origin of charge and yes it has been measured to approximately 10 to the minus 17 meters so i suggest that's rather good you'll see here also i have a uh, a plan view of, of a proton it's got its primary oscillation but it, but it also has uh, in order if it was primary opera oscillation only you'd get a, a field like this uh, but it's spread out and the only way that can spread out is electromagnetic radi radiation love one-third frequency harmonics and you'll see so the but one third frequency is three times the radius and from conservation principles you get two positive, uh, one third harmonics and one one negative. And that, that's what gives this bulge here. And then you have uh, finally the, the core is about 38% uh, of the mass. Uh, these are uh, nearly 60% and this these are just a few percent. But uh, these Two positive and one negative have the same same ratio as quarks, and they're often uh, could be confused as quarks. These one ninth harmonics have all of the properties of muons. So this is not some fanciful diagram. They have, all of these has been detected. But the important thing to note is that the central core does have a charge, which un under this theory, the emission of charge is accurate to about. 10 to the minus 17, have been measured to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 17. What it does mean is the charge is not uniformly distributed. It, it occurs at the circumference of the rotating photon and in its plane. 
and these existences just pop in and out of existence as required for conservation principles and that's what extends the charge out like this and takes the proton's magnetic moment from the Bohr magnetron of charge times radius to nearly three times that. Now just to continue on in that same boat to just try and reinforce the concept that electric charge is a property of the rotating photons. We're all know all familiar. You get a particle and antiparticle pair, they approach, they've got magnetic fields. In this case, they just unlock each other's angular momentum. The same photons just go conservation momentum, they go off in opposite directions. Uh, there are slight variations to this, of course, but when the photons go off, they do not have charge and they do not respond to magnetic fields. And it's just a, it's a good indication that uh, the rotating photon structure is the origins of charge. So that's how I'd like to suggest that that would be the best way to visualize charge in quantum mechanics. That's the best way to do it. So in addition to the photon properties point out, pointed out earlier, all matter particles are photons of the appropriate energy and polarity, making two revolutions per wavelength while still traveling at the speed of light. There are only four stable particles. You have electrons, protons, neutrons, and neutrinos. The rotating photon models suggest they should all have some properties in common. You know, these include mass, although it's different for each particle, electric charge, although neutrally charged particles are half positive and half negative, have a magnetic moment, which is the derived property, have angular momentum, with half h bar, duality, chirality, and more. Also included, but, but not explained in here, is the structure and properties of elementary particles like muons and pions and so on. But being made of the same substances, namely photons, their interchangeability should just be a rearrangement of the different frequency electromagnetic oscillations. And that's what I'm going to show here, where you have a neutron, which is a rotating plane polarized photon, and it, it, it has spin half h-bar, it, it uh, decays to a proton, which has positive charge, spin half h-bar. Uh, it also gives off an electron, negative charge, spin half h-bar, and that leaves half h-bar unaccounted for so you need that's where the uh, anti-electron neutrino comes along you've got charge zero spin minus half h-bar uh, the thing about it though is that uh, very, very little is known about them they're actually their rest mass is about 10 to the minus 4 ev per c squared now the reason for that there are two reasons for that the first is that uh, when a neutron, its average half-life is about 12 minutes, something like that. But when it starts to decay, the decay process takes about 10 to the minus uh, 10 seconds. And that gives the neutrino a rest mass of 10 to the minus 4 EV per C squared. Yeah, okay, it is a theoretical calculation, but they can keep measuring if they were to get fine enough. I'll explain later that 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 is the mass of electron neutrinos that sorry the rest mass now the above is illustrated that all individual subatomic particles expose a photon to the appropriate energy successfully explained through visualization some of their physical properties you know, the photons have mass has been measured they have spin they have intrinsic spin in particles, you have the chiralities, direction of spin with respect to magnetic field, electric charge is generated at the rotating photon circumference and in two dimensions, and neutral particles are half positive and half negative. There's a whole lot more information contained in this book. Okay, so that's quantum mechanics. It gives you, it gives you an indication of how to visualize spin, uh, charge, mass, etc., uh, chirality, right, that's where the two thumbs are poking out. But theories are called relativity because the observed results of the physical properties of length, time, and mass are relative to the observer and the observed. So having dealt with quantum mechanics, we now want to do the, the relativity part. There is no absolute rest position or zero velocity anywhere in the universe. 
the variations are determined by the speed of light being constant for all observers, irrespective of their uh, speed and position. Special relativity theory deals only with constant velocity between observer and observed. The more general case applied to one or both observer and observed being accelerated. Well, that was in theory what Einstein was pretending to get across, but he uh, didn't quite. I showed earlier uh, the derivation of E equals mc squared. It's very simple. And energy is photons traveling in a straight line, and mass is the same photon rotating at the speed of light. And that's relatively easy to visualize. Now, the relative, theories of relativity started when Michelson and Morley measured the speed of light as Earth traveled around the sun and found that it was always constant. So there are those who question the findings of the validity of these experiments and Einstein's uh, equation. No, they they just don't understand. They're more more just not. They're showing their own lack of knowledge of what's actually going on. Now, after the Michelson Morley experiments, Lorentz attributed the factor of variation of length and time uh, with uh, according to one minus b squared over c squared. He published that a little bit before Einstein published his. He used a um, let's say a lot more detail he introduced the third correction factor of mass from which he worked out the uh, equivalent of e equals mc squared now the information if you ever gone through his electrodynamics paper it, it's exceedingly detailed uh, I, I question whether it's actually all necessary or not but that's another story but he did work these things out and this is particularly important when it came to nuclear energy so one shouldn't be too harsh on him uh, apart from making the mathematics so difficult that most people just can't follow them it made visualization very very difficult now, every experiment, I kid ourselves, every experiment ever conducted to test special relativity corrections has verified them. So the next question is, well, how do the rotating photons give rise to uh, those corrections? Well, we've already dealt with this one. Now, the thing about a uh, rotating photon, uh, and we'll deal with um, stable particles only, the photon's h-bar spin twist means that in the case of the belt here, we had to tie the ends together to uh, stop it from unfurling. But when, when, when the structure already twists through 360 degrees every wavelength, then the ends will automatically come together. They do not need to and do not join. Now, then you get, well, how, how, do, how does a rotating photon move? Well, there may be some, but photons can't move sideways. So any possibility of this structure rolling along like that is out of the question. The only way they can move is perpendicular to, they would orient their axis perpendicular to their direction of travel. I should point out that has been measured as well, and it does occur. And you know, viewed end on, for example, particle at rest will just rotate as the, uh, and this is just described the axis again. Viewed side on, it would look like an ellipse, and viewed end on, the axis will just appear to be going up and down. Now, when it comes to the particle moving, uh, again, viewed end on, it'll just be a circle. Viewed obliquely, it will spiral its way through space and if you were uh, to sort of plot out that structure viewed side on it's almost like it's, it's almost like a sawtooth not quite its direction of travel is perpendicular to its radius the rotating photon circumference because it becomes a fixed length the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle and we all know well, you get a situation where 2 pi rv squared, which is this one, plus vt squared equals ct squared. It's just Pythagoras' theorem, and this gives a little bit of indication. For example, this would be for a particle, the speed of the photon is a, is a fixed length, 
when you have a slowly moving particle, then the radius remains large. But as the speed increases, the radius diminishes, uh, but the length of the hypotenuse always remains the same. Now, it doesn't matter. You, know, you can tell you can take this these triangles and you can wrap them around the cylinder like so, and this property still applies. And same here, you've got a smaller diameter cylinder. And so the first thing that you notice out of this is that the radius of the particle will diminish. And to give it this gives uh, perhaps a, an illustration, not exactly the same, but you have the uh, photon making six revolutions or traveling three wavelengths. If you could regard this as a, a KV electron, then they really spiral close together. But when you get to high energies, six oscillations covers a, a greater distance. But well, two, two things to note. First of all, the radius, because of this effect, the radius of an individual particle diminishes as its speed increases. But it's not quite that straightforward because if it, if it just did that, then the mass has to increase faster than the energy you put in input to get it to the higher speed. But that is overcome by the photon's rotation slowing down. But it still must travel at the speed of light. So it develops what you call a forward slip motion. It's not that the, the photons are slipping like this. Here you have the black line represents the photon as it would spiral its way through space without that slip. The slip um, travel just means it travels uh, the actual spiral, as shown here, the actual spiral increases. Now, it's this, the, the slowing down of rotation is what causes time to slow down. The, in, as shown here, the six revolutions at a higher speed gets to, well, to, to an observer in uh, traveling with either this or this, the photon would just seem to go up and down in the same space as you would expect. But to the external observer, this one spirals a little slower. And uh, for the same spiral, this one goes a much greater distance. And that is why uh, to a, an observer traveling, this structure means that the spiral has to travel fewer cycles, uh, spirals to get to the distance. And that is what makes distance diminish as speed increases. So again, so the, this rotating photon uh, model, mass increases, uh, well, Einstein already worked it out, but it, you're putting energy in it, something has to do something, so that's straightforward. Radius diminishes because the speed of light is constant, and that's the uh, hypotenuse of a right angle triangle under any circumstances. Uh, time slows down because it has to rotate at turn around at a slower speed, and that slower speed means that the distances that travelled per revolution is, is increased, and that makes it look the number of spirals required to travel a particular distance just diminishes. And that's essentially the physical origins or how to visualise the physical origins of uh, special relativity. So this brings us back, these you're all familiar with, uh, but to those, they're all due to the rotating photon structure of matter. And to those, we need to add this one, uh, the radius diminishes according to the same correction. Now, the importance of this shows up in measuring electron collision cross-sections. The GEV energies, they scatter with a cross section of about 10 to the minus 17 meters. The TEV energies, they scatter at a cross section of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. They gave physicists confidence that electrons can be treated or had to be treated as point particles. Now, that makes studying what's going on very, very difficult. An electron is only a point particle at high energies. At low energy, it has a radius of uh, 193 fm. But, and from that, 
these uh, collision cross sections are predicted because of that. So again, that makes visualization of the relativistic properties of an electron considerably easier, in my opinion. The thing to bear in mind is that the special relativity corrections do not apply to linear photons. They only exist when traveling at the speed of light, and that's determined by the electric permittivity of local space. Their mass is directly related to their frequency. Now, any read of Einstein and Lorentz's derivations or special relativity corrections is complex. In this presentation, these corrections are little more than Pythagoras' theorem applied to the rotating photon structure of particles. The first section discussed some of the quantum properties that all particles have as a result of the rotating photon structure. It was a summary of all the physical descriptions of particles in general. Now, applied to the structure of protons and neutrons, it makes nuclear binding and structures much easier to understand. Applied to neutrinos, it makes their apparently complex properties very easy to understand. That just goes all the way through with particle physics. Now, I'd like to suggest that the above has pointed out the logical simplicity and order of harmony considered necessary by Einstein. A physical description of the rotating photon structure of all particles led to the special relativity corrections when they moved. Now, it could be argued that this rotating photon structure of matter was not known, and as I suggested earlier, everything I was using was known physical principles and constants. Well, photons generating particle-antiparticle pairs have been known for decades. And the same thing, particle-antiparticle annihilation generating photons has also been known for decades. And I accept no responsibility for others, Drs. Williamson and Vandermark excluded, being unable to visualize the logical simplicity of the order and harmony that suggests that particles are confined photons. This is the proof, so I respectfully suggest that the rotating photon structure, or well, the foundations for the rotating photon structure have been known for decades, and it's not John and my fault that nobody else has picked up on them. Now, despite the supposed unity of the standard model, there is still competition, I suggest, between Einstein's visualize the logical simplicity of and harmony and Dirac's importance of beauty in, in one's equations. But mathematics has become a clear winner. Now, comments have been made, zero isn't zero, at least what the math, that's what the mathematics tells us. Well, I've got news for the bloke. When his bank balance runs to zero, zero is zero. And any suggestion that somebody did some calculations and got it in there, not my fault if people can't calculate things correctly. Another one released a few uh, years or so ago, time cancelled out in our equation, so time doesn't exist. I mean, it doesn't stop people. They all wear a wristwatch. They all conduct their lives according to the times they arrive at work, etc., and they all age according to time. Of course, time exists. Uh, mathematicians, yeah, uh, uh, the logic, in both cases, logic says that these are correct and the same. A logical simplicity in order, uh, they're, they're just wrong statements. A part of that, of course, was uh, I think a lot of people have been trying to get beauty in their equations. And on top of that, Einstein used unnecessarily complex maths so complex that many just can't visualize the order and harmony that exists in them. Now, I just want to repeat again, to don't rely entirely on mathematics. Like I said, most people can't solve those. The experts, even the experts came up with this solution, whereas that one is the reality from these. And yet, in reality, these equations, which are just minor variations for Newton's equations, are very easy to use. And I'd suggest that some good high school matriculants, if not high school students, would have no difficulty using these. But even the experts have huge difficulties using those. And it's for those reasons that I suggest that being able to visualize what is going on makes it much easier to understand. So, 
don't be too impressed by people who think they can handle field equations. They can't. And I'd also like to suggest, you know, when when the mathematics has a physical reason, you can make it as complex as you like and that it will be correct. But there is a physical reason under that, but it's well and truly hidden away for most people. Now, the important message about it, the others is that I, I, I suggest that visualizing the physics makes it much easier to calculate the effect. I mean, uh, you've seen uh, Einstein's special relativity was calculated just using little more than uh, Pythagoras' theorem. And I've given the exact calculations to uh, Einstein's uh, gravity and expanded on that to give the actual physical origins of gravity because it can be visualized. Everything in cosmology to do with black holes is just wrong. Uh, one of the other things about cosmology is if the if gravity is weaker than inverse square, which I'm saying it is, an infinite steady state universe won't collapse. And then there are other reasons for all of the explanations that are observed. So the whole concept because people are just using complex maths that they don't understand the whole complex of the expanding universe, uh, Big Bang, and that, uh, or the accelerated expansion. It has no foundation in maths. It has no foundation in logic. And that's why I make the suggestion to you that, yes, you're better off being able to visualize it. And John, I, I'm still very impressed with your uh, Desai Mu G, but when you realize it equals zero, it you're right. It's, uh, it's, it has a very significant meaning. The good good news is that it has a very physical meaning as well. It's not just mathematics off doing something. And as I mentioned to John before, for the benefit of his design, UG obviously predicts an infinite steady state universe.